Watching the protests that happened in the wake of the murder of George Floyd uh, back in the U.S. from here in England, I've been thinking a lot about this painting that was done in 2014 by artist Titus Kaffar, who uh, lives and works in New Haven, Connecticut, um, that I saw at the Yale University Art Gallery. And um, this painting was originally made um, for Time magazine. The magazine commissioned Kfar to paint this portrait in response to the protests in Ferguson, Missouri uh, in that same year. And when they asked him to make this painting, he said that he knew at the time that it was about so much more than just Ferguson, Missouri, uh, that this is an issue that was pervasive throughout the United States and is pervasive throughout the United States. And it's about more than Missouri or Minneapolis or New York or anywhere else. It's a issue that our country has to really grapple with um, in a very severe and meaningful way. Uh, and so he says that this is really one of the most personal paintings he's ever made in ways that are not always readily visible to the people who come and see the painting in a museum but are really important to him as the person who created this image and put the image out into the world. And art, I think, always has that double valence to it. There's the meaning that we as viewers have access to, and there's also the hidden meaning that we can never really know unless the person who created the object shares it with us. Um, and so this painting called Yet Another Fight for Remembrance is all about the struggle to be seen uh, and what of us is able to be seen. And so Kafar made a composition of protesters from Ferguson and then took white paint and whitewashed over the uh, protesters themselves. And so we're seeing them in front of us, but we're also seeing the way that we are not seeing them. Their voices and mouths are literally being covered up by this white paint. And so their absence, the fact that we're not able to hear them and not able to see them, is made visible to us by the explicit erasure of their presence. And so this talks back on two levels about what's happening in this painting. It's about the invisibility of black people to the police who don't see them as uh, equal or as important. Um, and it's also the explicit attempt to then erase the people that are seen. And the way that when people are seen, when black people are seen by uh, these police officers, they are erased um, in the most explicit and violent way. And so there's this constant struggle between an attempt to be seen and what happens once you are seen and controlling how you're seen. And so like this painting, um, individuals don't have the opportunity to express their inner selves to the people around them. And uh, you can't always show everything of yourself to the people that you interact with on a quick basis. And so we're all always seen and hidden. Um, And the very nature of protest is making yourself seen and being able to have your voice elevated above the forces that would attempt to whitewash the words that come out of your mouth or even your very ability to speak. And so even in this protest, we're seeing it on another level. Um, the figures are being whitewashed out, but then they're fighting back against them and have this black outline that is forcing the, the protesters through the silencing white of the paint. And so even when they're covered up, their presence is still made visible. And then in the back here, we have the ultimate in seen and unseen object, which is the cell phone that is uh, being held up. We only have the black outline of the phone. Um, that is recording everything that's around it. And it's, and it's taking things that previously would have remained unseen and bringing them into the public eye. And as we've seen so harrowingly this week, these videos have, um, and cell phone footage, have the potential um, to reveal the 
injustices that in many ways are hidden without this footage to so many people. Um, so we have the whitewashed figures, the cell phone that's bringing them to light, and then um, we're forced now into an encounter with the people who are protesting. And by virtue of how we look at a painting, we are always standing in opposition to them. So we're standing in front of them. They're facing us and making eye contact with us, forcing us to see them and to see what's happening here in this painting. And I think ultimately, one of the reasons this painting I think is so powerful is because even though there is such an explicit and strong articulation of silencing and of violence, there's a semblance of hope to it. Um, that's incredibly subtle. And I think if we, if we don't listen to the words of the artist, we don't necessarily even know about. Um, but the white paint that he uses uh, to cover up these figures is mixed in with linseed oil. And so over time, as the oil dries and evaporates, the paint itself loses its thickness and becomes transparent. And what was once hidden becomes visible again. And I think that that works on a poetic level to show us the fluidity of power, showing us how power dynamics can change and how ultimately people can rise up and make their voices heard um, and can change the way that society interacts with individual people by uh, forcing them to look you in the eye and uh, to have a moment of reckoning uh, with what our history uh, and actions are and have been. And I think even though this painting was made six years ago now, uh, it is just as relevant in 2020 as it was in 2014. And as Titus Kfar himself has said, uh, when the news stops talking about this issue, that doesn't mean that it isn't happening. And so this is something that's been happening since even before uh, Ferguson in 2014 and um, continues to happen now. And this painting, I think, serves in many ways as a constant reminder of the ways that this is happening, both publicly and in the national media and national eye, um, and also on a much smaller scale on the day-to-day -day interactions that are not seen by the whole country and the whole world.